Welcome to all our guests and thank you for joining us for our first virtual First Friday Family Night. I'm Diana Turner, Guest Services Manager at Curiosity. Tonight we have an entertaining educational evening for you featuring Beetle Lady Entomologist Dr. Stephanie Dole and live music from Joe Bug of the Bug Family Band. Before we get started, for those of our in our audience who aren't familiar with Curiosity, we're a science playground and zoo in San Mateo, California. Here are a few scenes of the animal and science experiences our guests enjoy when they visit us. Curiosity. They think they're playing. Curiosity Science Playground and Zoo. Visit us. Until Curiosity reopens to help support our families at home, we have launched a new Curiosity at Home Science and Zoo Resource Center on our website. Here you can experience exciting animals in action videos, science in action experiment videos, at home science experiments and at home science kits. Now I'd like to introduce our first featured guest, a well known scientist, educator, and researcher who has a long history of educating and entertaining Curiosity families. Beetle Lady Entomologist, Dr. Stephanie Dole. Thank you, Diana. Hi everyone, it's Dr. Stephanie Dole, or Beetle Lady, or Dr. Dole, or Dr. Bug, and I am an entomologist here in San Mateo, California, where I run the educational business Beetle Lady and offer classes for all ages about the fascinating world of insects and arth other arthropods. Maybe you've seen me at your school, maybe I've come to your local library, or you've seen me at Curiosity, or perhaps I've come to your home for a birthday party or another event, and I really miss seeing all of you in person, and I'm very excited to get up and going again. But right now, we are all sheltering in place, and for a lot of you, what that means is hanging out at home, maybe with your families, maybe with your family dog or cat, but for me, that also means hanging out here at my home office with these tarantulas that I live with. And I have about 30 different tarantulas and a lot of other insects and arachnids. And I wanted, thought I'd maybe share some of those with you tonight and teach you a little bit about what makes them so fascinating. So tonight I wanted to talk to you a bit about how they grow, which is quite different from the way that you and I grow. And this has to do with their skeletons. Now, can any of you out there on Facebook Live see my skeleton right now? Probably not, right? And why is that? It's because my skeleton's on the inside of my body. I have bones on the inside of my body. I have what's called an endoskeleton. And if I wanted to turn myself into an arthropod, which are insects and spiders, scorpions, and then some sea creatures that marine biologists study, like crabs and shrimp, I would need to give myself a new skeleton. And what that skeleton is gonna be is it's gonna be an exoskeleton. It's gonna be a hard shell on the outside of my, my body. So let me give myself this exoskeleton. And now I have this amazing tough protective coating and it has a lot of really good advantages. One thing is that it is super hard shell that's gonna protect me from the environment. Another thing is it keeps me from drying out, which is a really big issue for some arthropods, especially if they live in hot, dry environments. And um, another really cool thing about the exoskeleton, probably my favorite exoskeleton fact, is that it can be formed and changed through evolution in lots of incredible ways. To give you some examples of that, this is a longhorn beetle from Papua New Guinea. And as maybe you can see, it's reflective and shiny and iridescent, and that's all structural coloration of the exoskeleton. That's the way that this exoskeleton reflects light. And it also has lots of bumps and things and knobs on its body that would probably be really, really awful to put in your mouth. So those are good defense things that an exoskeleton can be made into. Here's another one 
This is a stag beetle from Sumatra, and this beetle has these big stag beetle jaws, and this male beetle uses these jaws that are made out of exoskeleton to fight with other males and defend its territory and get females. So a lot of cool things that exoskeletons can do. Now, here's the drawback, because you know there's got to be a drawback. This tough exoskeleton is made of a material that's kind of like plastic. It is formed chemical bonds that makes, give it structure and that make it permanent. And so it's not easy for an insect to change their exoskeleton once it's hardened. So what they have to do when they grow is they have to take their skeleton off. And the key thing here is that this means that unlike you and me who grow little by little, all you kids out there right now, you're still gonna fit in that t-shirt you're wearing tonight, probably tomorrow morning for sure, right? Maybe you'll even wear it for a few days since we're not going anywhere for a few days. So that t-shirt, you will still be able to wear the next day. You'll never wake up one morning and have to buy all new clothes all of a sudden. But if you were an arthropod, you would because when they take off their skeleton, they have a sudden lot of growth where they puff up their body a little bit while their new skeleton is still soft and it hasn't hardened yet. They can unfurl things like wings and other structures will come out. And so this is the way that they grow. And we call this molting. This is the molt of a cockroach. This is a colossal cockroach from South America that I have in my um, collection. And this is not a dead cockroach. This is the skeleton of a cockroach that is still around. And if you even look on the back, I don't know if you can see, but it, it has almost like an opening, like you'd have a zipper going down the back of a dress where it actually popped open and that's where it pulled itself out of its old skeleton. So it's a pretty cool thing that they can do. So right now I want to introduce you to the first live bug that I'm going to show you. This is one of my favorite local bugs because it's one of the most largest and most fascinating insects I think that we have out here. I'm going to tilt my camera down so you can see it a little better. This is a Jerusalem cricket. And a few really cool things about the Jerusalem cricket. This is an example of why common names, oops, there we go, can be kind of bad. This is not a cricket. It's related to crickets and katydids. It is an, arthrop um, an orthopteran. And these orthopterans are in a special group though called the stenopelmatidae, and those are uh, Jerusalem crickets, but they're not true crickets. They um, also do not live in Jerusalem. So there goes that also. And I wanted to show you this. This is a boy. His name is Daniel Tiger. Have any of you kids ever seen one of these? Maybe you have. Um, these are everywhere in the San Francisco Bay Area. I've actually caught these with kids right outside of Curiosity in the field there at Coyote Point. Uh, this is Daniel Tiger, and he's a boy. And I can tell he's a boy because if he was a girl, he'd have a long ovipositor coming out of his back end, which is, would be what... Um, she would lay eggs with, but a boy doesn't lay eggs, so he doesn't need that. And the last thing I want to show you about him, oh, I forgot to say, if you haven't seen these, the reason is they are usually digging in the ground. They like to eat roots, things like that. So you might see these when you're digging for a new garden bed or when you're adding on to your house and making a new foundation, or sometimes they will be wandering about late at night and we will see them then. Um, the other thing I wanna point out about him, maybe some of you have gotten to touch him in my classes, and you'll remember that he has exoskeletons that are different. This part of his exoskeleton is super hard, like that stag beetle, it's tough and strong. But his abdomen is squish, squish, squishy, and I, that shows how these animals can have exoskeletons that can be very different. They can be versatile and they can take different forms. If you're having trouble imagining this, just think about a caterpillar. A caterpillar has an exoskeleton, but it's a super squishy bug. All right, so that's Daniel Tiger, the Jerusalem cricket, and they live right out here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Now, I know a lot of you tuned in tonight because you heard I was going to show you a bird eater tarantula. And so we're going to get to her in a moment. I want to first um, tell you a little bit about this name because bird eater sounds pretty scary, right? And maybe you're not hearing any birds in my office right now that I have for feeding my tarantulas, and that's because none of them eat birds. Um, in the wild, some bird eaters will occasionally eat a larger animal like a bird, but they're not 
not a regular part of their diet. So my bird eater tarantula got her name from a very old book. This is the biggest book I own. This is a book by a woman named Maria Marianne, and she lived a long time ago. She lived from 1647 to 1717. That was a long time ago. And she was an artist and naturalist, and she was one of the first people in the West to figure out the life cycle of things like butterflies and moths. She figured out which caterpillars turned into certain butterflies and which caterpillars turned into certain moths. And you know how she did this? She did this by watching with her eyes and drawing and etching and doing beautiful artwork of what she observed. And this book is a book she made in 1705 from an expedition that she took to Suriname, which is now called Guyana. It's in um, Central America. And she uh, did this book of etchings. And I want to show you the etching that she did that gave this bird eater tarantula its name. Can we cue that picture, please? Yeah, so as you can see right here, this picture has um, a tarantula in the corner that's eating a hummingbird. And that is, um, I'm sure that Maria Marianne actually saw this because she was a good naturalist who painted what she observed. Um, but uh, it turns out people thought that was super exciting. But once we started going to this part of the world more and realizing that they didn't do this, um, the name had already stuck. And it was such a great, exciting name that we call all of these large tarantulas like this bird eater tarantulas. Um, but what they mainly eat is large bugs and some lizards and things like that. Um, OK, so now I want to show you my bird eater tarantula. Oh, here it is. It's huge. No, I'm just kidding. This is my tarantula puppet. And I'm going to use her to teach you a little bit about how I can tell when they're going to grow and how Anansi, my bird eater tarantula, grows. Because I want to teach you about the last time she grew. So when she's got to grow, she's got to take off her skeleton. And there's a few ways I can tell that Anansi is getting ready to take off her skeleton. The first way is that often she'll look a little different, especially here on her abdomen. They have hairs on their abdomen that eventually rub off of them. And so sometimes the hairs will be missing and then I can start to see the new hairs and the new exoskeleton underneath. So that's the first way. The other thing that she will start to do is she won't be very hungry very much. Now, that's not just like you and me skipping one meal a day or something like that. All of these tarantulas here, they eat one time a week. And that's how I can have 30 tarantulas and still have time to do anything else other than feeding them. And so she will not eat. You didn't eat when I fed you today. Mm -mm. Are you, you going to eat next time? Mm -mm. So sometimes that could mean she won't eat for months with some of my tarantulas before they're going to molt. So that's my other clue. My next clue is tarantulas actually really like to shelter in place. They like to feel safe. So all my tarantulas have a little hole, a little place like this, like this wooden log that they can hide in in their cage. And sometimes what they will do is they will hide in there and then they'll also fill up the front of it with dirt so that I can't see inside. That's my next clue. And inside there, she will be making a web. Now, tarantulas make webs too. If you can see on this puppet, she has these two little things. They are look like little uh, fingers, and they are called spinnerets. Her liquid web will come out of her back of her abdomen, and those spinnerets will lay it down. Depending on the kind of tarantula, they'll make a different kind of web for when they're going to molt. Let me show you one. This right here is a arboreal tree tarantula. And actually, that is not the tarantula. That is right down here. And this is a tunnel-like web that this tarantula builds when it's going to molt for shelter. And this is its old skeleton that it has left behind that it took off the last time it molted. Now, for my bird eater, she will make either a rug inside her tunnel or she will make a hammock. And what I'm going to show you now is going to be a video of the very last time that she molted her exoskeleton. And that was a few weeks ago. And the video that we're gonna show is gonna be a fast video. It took place over four hours, but it's what is called a time-lapse video. So you're gonna see it all happen in 30 seconds. Okay, we can cue that video now. 
So what you're seeing here is a Nancy, and she is laying on a hammock that she made near the top of her cage, which was kind of unusual to be so out in the open. So I took this chance to film this, and now you're gonna see she starts to twitch, and here she comes out of her whole skeleton, even her fangs have been molted. So that, that took place in my house right here in San Mateo just a few weeks ago. And what a tarantula leaves behind when they do this molting looks like this. It, it is an old leftover exoskeleton of a tarantula. This one actually belongs to a tarantula that is right here. Her name is Barbara, and she actually just molted again about two weeks ago. Um, in fact, she almost had a dangerous mold, but because we were doing shelter in place, I saw that she hadn't gone all the way on her back and she was on her side and I helped her get on her back and she did okay. So here um, are her fangs even get molted. So that's a really cool artifact that I then have to teach with. Okay, you guys ready to meet Anansi? Okay, let's get Anansi out. Now, if you've seen me, oh, I dropped a glove. If you've seen me um, do presentations with my tarantulas before, you know I hold a lot of them right in my bare hands. And maybe some of you have even held some of my tarantulas in your bare hands at one of my classes. And Nazi, um, the reason that I actually can hold all of my tarantulas like that is all the tarantulas I keep are what are called uh, New World tarantulas. That means they all are from Nor uh, North America and South America and Central America there, and they um, tend to never have really bad bites. They don't have very strong venom. I don't have to worry about that at all. But the way they defend themselves is they have these hairs on their abdomens and they're kind of itchy. If these hairs come off, they just make your nose and eyes itch and stuff like that. And we don't want to be having an itchy nose or eyes. Now with my other tarantulas, they do that um, they have, you have to pet them for that to happen. But with a Nancy, I've noticed that even just having her on my hand, my hands will itch after. So just so I don't have itchy hands, I'm gonna put on these gloves for holding a Nancy today. Um, itchy hands are worth it though when you get to hold a cool tarantula. Okay, now let me get her down. Okay, so a Nancy is what is called a Bahia bird eater tarantula. These are also called scarlet bird eaters, and their species name is Lassiodora klugai, if you want to know that. Here's her happy little home that she has. I'll set that down over here. And Anansi tends to be a little skittish, so we're going to get her out carefully. Come on, girl. There she is. Okay. Here she is. So this is Anansi. She is a bird eater tarantula. And these are native, this particular species is native to Brazil. Um, here, let me tilt this down a little better for you. There you go. Um, they're native to, to Brazil. She is a fairly tame tarantula, especially for a bird eater. You wouldn't want to do this with a lot of other bird eater species. They are not um, that tame and not very easy to hold. My main thing I have to worry about right now is keeping Anansi safe. Um, but you can see how big she is. She's a pretty big spider. When I got her, she was about the size of my thumb. And I got her about three years ago. She is a captive bred tarantula. That means that Anansi has never, ever been to Brazil. She's never been to the rainforest. She has only lived in the United States. Um, and so that means she was born um, at a tarantula breeder's place. And then I bought them, her from them as a baby. Actually, I bought them, the person I bought them from was a, a woman tarantula breeder. And uh, Nancy grows little by little by little, uh, or not little by little by little, but she grows um, a lot. She grows very, very, very fast. Um, so she, when she molts, she molts way more often than any of my other tarantulas. She will molt a bunch of times a year, and it is very impressive how quickly she gets bigger. Now, I've been calling her a she. Anansi is a girl spider. Spiders can be boys and girls. If this was a boy of the same species, it would live only about four years. Now, some of you have met some of my tarantulas and you know that the boys of a lot of other species live maybe seven to nine years. These ones, they grow so fast that they actually, uh, the boys don't even live five years a lot of the time. But 
Anansi the girl, so lucky me, she's going to be with me for 15 to 20 years. She's not even five years old yet. So that is Anansi. Her favorite food um, are large cockroaches. She's kind of gotten a little too big for crickets. I don't ever feed her anything like mice. Some people do, um, but you don't really have to. They do fine with crickets and big grasshoppers and um, things like that. So that is Anansi. And as you can see, I always like to tell people that they don't get very, um, they're not aggressive. They just are defensive. This is actually a really shy animal. And so if she ever tried to bite me or anything, it would be because she was scared. Um, as you can see, she is just, just wanting to get back to her house. So we're going to put her back in her house, let her go back to sheltering in place, give her her hide, just like us. They want to feel safe and secure. And so we give her her hide, and then she can feel safe and secure, although she went up there, as you can see. All right, so that's Anansi, and she is a Bahia bird eater from Brazil. All right, so I wanted to share one other thing with you before taking a few questions, and that is that I am starting a new mobile museum with Beetle Lady. Um, this is going to start this fall. Hopefully, we'll all be back at school and things. And for this mobile museum, I've made some new displays, and we are going. Uh, I'm going to have these displays available that people can rent out um, a whole insect museum that they can bring and have at their school or their community center, or their library, up for a day or two, and let lots of people come. To visit. It's like a, a field trip that you don't have to go on a bus for. Um, so let's put up one, this display that I want to show you. Um, here it is. And oh, I need to make sure I remember which way to go. I'm going this way. Okay. And um, so kids, if you look at this display, this is a display that is all about exoskeletons. Um, the exoskeletons in this display, there are three that are real and there are three that are fake. Can you tell which ones are real and which ones are fake? Yeah, so there are three. If you guess that the three that look like um, white bones are fake, you are correct. Those three are Halloween decorations. And a person who makes Halloween decorations may not realize this, but you and I know that insects and spiders don't have bones in their body. And so those are just pretend things. What are the real skeletons are the other three things in the box. And the one right there in that top, top corner is Anansi's last skeleton. That's the one you saw in her molt video that we just watched together. Um, so and, uh, the other two are a butterfly and a cicada. And the cool thing about having an exoskeleton means that these uh, insects, although they are dead, they look just like they did in life. And this is a great thing um, for insect collections because when me as an entomologist wants to keep some of these bugs in a collection, I just have to take care of these very fragile, beautiful skeletons. And if I take care of them and people continue to take care of them after I'm gone, then they can last hundreds of years and scientists can study them for a very long time. And all of the outer structures of the bug are preserved. So it's a wonderful thing about insects. Um, so that is my exoskeletons display. And I am now available. I can take some questions. If any of you have some questions to type, I'm going to take a few live um, before we start the music. And then any ones that I don't get to now, I will be on uh, the chat and I can type in um, different um, answers for you. OK, I see one from Sandy asking, when did you start getting interested in insects? So. I was always a biology kid. I always loved animals. In fact, when I was seven years old, I thought turtles were the best thing in the whole wide world. And I still do love turtles. And then when I was 11 years old, I wanted to be a cetacean biologist, which is somebody who studies whales and dolphins. And then um, towards the end of high school, I fell in love with bugs. I just that's the best way I can describe it. I just thought they were the most beautiful, wonderful things that I had ever experienced in the world, and they bring a lot of joy to me. And so the more I learned about it, the more I loved them. So it wasn't until a little later, but then I got into them, and then I studied them in college, and that's how it happened. Ooh, how many spiders do I have? Amy wants to know. You know, somebody asked me the other day, and I think we counted 34? 
I'd have to, I can give you an exact number. Most of them live alone, so it's a little easier for me to get a count of how many I have because I don't have any that live colonially. I tried that once and I ended up with just one big fat happy tarantula instead of four in the same cage. Uh, and But other ones, um, that I, about 34 right now. And then I have some insects and some other arachnids like scorpions as well. Um, what is the difference between tarantulas and spiders? Tarantulas are a special group of spiders. They're a, an evolutionary clade of spiders that are very large and very hairy. There's about a thousand species of tarantulas. So it's just a particular evolutionary branch of spiders that got particularly big and hairy. Yeah. Um, okay, and I have another one is, why do males have shorter lifespans? This is a really good question. Now, in the wild, it's kind of easy to say why male spiders have shorter lifespans. Um, how many of you have gone to uh, Mount Diablo and seen the tarantula migration, right? Uh, that happens in the fall around here. That's actually not a migration. It is the male tarantulas going out looking for love. So it's the boys kind of cruising for girls, and they put themselves in a lot more risk when they do that because they're crossing roads and they're wandering all over paths and things like that. So in the wild, that's part of why tarantulas live longer as females because the females stay home and hunker down in their burrow. Isn't that a good lesson for us right now? Just stay home and hunker down. But um, in captivity, the same thing happens. And it just, their bodies just are programmed to, once the males, they do something called hooking out. They get a big long hook on their front leg and that's for courtship and mating. And usually when your male hooks out, you've got him for only a few more months, maybe a year at most, um, and then he will pass on. So it just so happens. Um, okay, and I'm gonna answer one more question. I think I have time for one more. Um, do tarantulas like to live alone or with other tarantulas? So almost all species of tarantulas are what, uh, solitary, and they you really can't have them together at all. Um, sometimes people put them together for breeding. Um, I did, I mentioned earlier, I did have one that was a colonial species that I tried once. Uh, the trick there is you actually want them really close together. If you spread them out in too big of a cage, then they don't see each other very often, and when they do see each other, they think they're food. If you keep them in a tight cage, they're always seeing each other, always bumping into each other, and then they always remember that they're nest mates. But for me, that turned out to be one big fat happy tarantula <laughs> instead of four little tarantulas living together. So I didn't get it to work, um, but I know a few people who have. Um, so I will keep answering uh, questions. Uh, I wanted to say a couple other things. Um, I, I'll come on and do some more of the chat questions while Joe is playing. And I also wanted to let you know about a great opportunity to keep helping scientists like me and contributing to our understanding of the natural world around us, even while we're doing this sheltering in place. Because I know a lot of you are going on walks in your neighborhood or exploring your own backyards. And when you do that, you can take photos of the plants and animals you encounter counter and you can use an app called iNaturalist. This is a wonderful app, iNaturalist, that you can use to record what you see and it goes into a giant database where other people all around the world are recording observations of the plants and animals they encounter in the natural world. And iNaturalist is about to have their April um, bio blitz. It's called the City Nature Challenge Bio Blitz, where different urban areas around the country are competing um, in fact, it's probably around the whole world, are competing for who can record the most species in their area. And so you can participate in this. It runs from April 24th to the 27th, and it's not being canceled because you can do it. You can keep on doing it with shelter in place. So please participate in that. Um, I would like to introduce now one of my favorite musicians, this is Joe Bug of the Bug Family Band. And the Bug Family Band um, has a great collection of songs for kids and kids at heart. And a lot of them are about bugs. And I love listening to this band, and I know you will too. So check out Joe Bug. Take it away, Joe. And thank you again for having me tonight. And you can check out Beetlelady.com to learn more about what I do. And I'll be here to answer your questions. Take it away, Joe Bug. Hi, everybody. 
I'm Joe Bug from the Bug Family Band. The Beetle Lady is our resident entomologist in the family. So thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, Beetle Lady, for dropping some knowledge about all those cool bugs. And I'm going to try to do the same here, but I'm going to do it to music, OK? So this first song is called Lepidoptera Love. And Lepidoptera is a group of insects. It's an order of insects um, that includes moths and butterflies. So moths and butterflies are pretty similar. They both have scaly wings. They fly around, but they have some differences too. Like the moths are out in the day. I mean, the moths are out at night and the butterflies are out during the day. So this is about a butterfly and a moth that fell in love and they had to work some things out in their relationship to make it work. Butterfly said to the moth, I really like your fuzzy wings. The little brown moth fluttered, and she gave the butterfly a wing. I fly by night, and I know you fly by day. Go toward the light, and I'll meet you just about halfway. Butterfly said to the moth, Feather and tell a rock. Moth said, It's my bedtime, but tomorrow is the All right, this next song I'm going to do is another song about bugs. And um, the Beetle Lady was telling you about exoskeletons. And that's what this song's about. It's called No Bones Within. Because bugs don't have bones on the inside, they've got their bones on the outside. And this song also talks about the three parts of an insect body. Does anybody know what those three parts are? Yeah, their head, thorax, abdomen. They're built inside out, no bones within. Head, thorax, abdomen. I'm talking about my insect friends. They go through metamorphic change. They turn from weird to really strange. Wings to fly and antennae to mouth parts to suck and chew. Yeah. 
<laughs> that song is by the Banana Slug String Band. They're a really fun band. You should check them out. If you got some time on your hands, maybe time to listen to some music. Look at the Banana Slug String Band. I know their music is on Bandcamp. And uh, the Bug Family, mu Family Music is also on Bandcamp. Um, and those first two songs I just played are from our Bug Family album called Songs from the Sky that we just put out last year. Uh, it's got a lot of fun stuff on it. And the next song I'm going to play is from our very first Bug Family album, and it's called The Problem with Smoothies. Okay, watch out for the brain freeze. Okay, let's get out, let's get back to the bug songs. This one's about one of my favorite bugs. They live in damp places like swamps and lakes and rivers. Four long wings floating on the air that the summer brings, buzzing around an old dead log. Better watch out for the big ball frog. Dragonfly, dragonfly, dragonfly. Catching bugs while you fly. Dip into the pond if you're feeling dry. Piggyback rides with a special friend. Let's spend an afternoon at the river bend. Dragonfly, dragonfly, dragonfly. Dragonfly, dragonfly. Water and swim. 
him around for years Never knowing that your wings are growing Right between your ears When you emerge before the dawn And shed your skin Put your aviators on Take a glide over the lawn Pollywog swims down below for his legs and his lungs to grow so he can hop through the grass and watch his dinner go buzzing past dragonfly 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 They're very mysterious, the dragonflies. Okay, this I'm, the next song I'm going to do here is a counting song. And um, what are we going to count? We're going to count bugs, of, of course, of course. Um, this song and dragonfly are on our, our second bug family album. It's called A, B, C, D. And um, so this one, maybe you can count with me. We're going to count up and we're going to count down. And we're gonna count up again and count down again and count up again. Yeah, you'll see how it goes. Second. Five, four, three, two. One little bee went buzz, buzz, buzz. Back to the hive with pollen on her toes to make a batch of honey. All the little grubs said yum, yum, yum. Sweet, sweet honey on a flotum beneath the sky so sunny. Two. Two big spiders hung.
butterflies fluttered by. Eight butterflies fluttered by, swallow tail and owl eye beneath the sky so sunny. Nine, nine termites, nine termites were munching wood. Nine termites were munching wood with a little sap and tastes so good beneath the sky so sunny. Countdown. Eight butterflies fluttered by, swallow tail and owl Seven crickets sang a tune and lasted through the month of June. Six velvet mites crawled on a rock, meet their lunch and they took a walk. Five army ants were marching home, following a trail of pheromones. Four black beetles perched on a lawn, counting twelve and they played the frog. Three centipedes in the dirt below, under the grass where the fungi grow. Two big spiders hung on a web, eating flies and gingerbread. And one little bee went buzz, 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 back to the hive with the pollen. Counting yet, we're gonna go all the way up to 12. Yeah, one dozen. And now we're on 10. 10 little ticks on the branch of a tree. Oh, look at the cute little ticks. Oh, wow. 10 little ticks on the branch of a tree waiting to drop on you or me beneath the sky so sunny. 11. 11 roly polies played kickball. 11 roly polies played kickball. We're gonna count all the way back down to one little bee. Twelve. Twelve ladybugs, they flew in quick. Twelve ladybugs, they flew in quick. Laid out a blanket for a big picnic beneath the sky so sunny. Eleven roly polies played kickball, and a one likes to be the ball. Ten little ticks on the branch of a tree, waiting to drop on you or me. Nine termites were munching wood with a little sap, it tastes so good. Nine termites were munching wood. That's a lot of bugs. If if you know how many bugs that is, 12 plus 11 plus 10 plus 9 plus um, all those numbers back to one, just post it here. And um, yeah, I'll be proud of you if you get it right, OK? OK, no calculators. OK, this one, next song is called Dandelion. Don't 
has borne much Just the wind from the sea The sun's love and touch And a little water To pick up my tired leaves To catch the sun's fading glow That is all I need Please help me grow Just a little All right. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. If you want to hear more Bug Family music, head over to our Bandcamp page, thebugfamilyband.bandcamp.com, and we've got all three of our albums on there. Um, you can stream them for free. You can um, buy them and download them and listen as much as you want. And uh, lots of fun music for, for you and your kids. I'm going to do one more song. And this is our theme song. Yeah. And it's called Bug Family. We are the Bug Family. Bug Family. We are the Bug Family. We are a big family. You are the bug family. We are the bugs. Pick up any rock and you'll find us under there. Pretty beetle, mother moth, sweaters full of things. At the edge of the trees, fireflies play hide and seek. Come outside, I'll land on your cheek. Bug family. We are. We are a big family. You are the bug family. We are the bugs. Step into the grass. Pick a flower for the bees. Granny, little mother moth. It's sweaters for the bees. And look up in the air. It's buddy butterfly the blue. Bringing sweet nectar back to you. Bug family. We are We are a big family. You are the bug family. We are the bugs. I'm going to tell you about the ladybug picnic. The ladybugs had a picnic, and everyone came. Casseroles and hummus, and throwing games. Landing on her throne, queen decrees. Little beetles stinging in the palace. Thanks for listening, everybody, and thanks for coming to First Friday. Have a great weekend. I'm going to turn it back over to Diana to say good night now. Thanks for having me, Curiosity. That was fun. 
Wow, that was so great. Oh, I had so much fun listening to Joe Bug from the Bug Family Band and to hearing everything that Stephanie had to share about her bird-eating tarantula and her Jerusalem cricket. So much fun. I hope you all out there had a great time. Thank you to both Dr. Stephanie Dole and to Joe Bug um, for participating in this virtual First Friday Family Night for Curiosity. I also want to thank all of you out there um, for joining us for this live event. Please see our other live and video events on Facebook and Instagram. See our website for tools for at-home learning. And please join us on May 1st at 5.30 for our next virtual First Friday Family Night. That night we're going to have falconer Kenny Elvin and his amazing raptors join us. So thanks to them, all of us at Curiosity. I hope you have a great night. Good night.